it's a huge pleasure to welcome Tim Carmichael here today. Um, Tim spent over 30 years in the British Army, uh, leading men and women across Europe, the Balkans, and Afghanistan. Uh, Tim was the very first Chief Data Officer, uh, and today that's what we're going to spend a large part of our time talking about. But before we get into that, Tim, I was wondering if you could just spend a little bit of time talking about in your career leading up to that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I was in the Army for 32 years which is a fairly long stint for anyone with the same employer, but there was a whole series of different appointments during that time, so a lot of variety. Uh, I joined the army straight out of school as a squeaky 18-year-old with not really a clue what was going on, but they soon train you. And my early career was spent um, leading groups of people, leading, leading groups of soldiers, uh, learning my trade as a leader, learning my um, abilities uh, in my technical environment, which was the telecommunications area, and progressing in that way. And what the Army is really good at is bringing people on and progressing them according to their potential and according to their skills. So I had a range of jobs which tended to bounce around between jobs that were pure leadership, dealing with people, uh, and jobs that tended to focus on uh, strategy, operations, policy, uh, and that kind of stuff. And so it was a very uh, beautifully varied career. It spread over many countries. Uh, some places I would love to have stayed and settled, other places that were fine to walk away from at the end of the day. Given the huge impact you and your team played in this new role, we're just interested to understand how the organisation was set up prior to this role and this team being established. How did it function in, in the way of leveraging and using data? Well, let's be really clear. It was functioning. Uh, nothing was failing, but uh, our aim was to make it more effective and more efficient. So you th should think of the Army as one organization with two personalities. Yeah. One of its personalities, quite bluntly, is to be the country's instrument of lethal force. So a lethal fighting force whose job it is to go somewhere and fight the enemies of the country. And when we do that, we're really good at decision making. We're really good. There's a mechanism that we learn and that we use and we train for to bring together all available information uh, to render that digestible for the man who's going to make the decision or the woman who's going to make the decision so they can make a great decision uh, and produce what we need to do to win in battle. The other manifestation of the army, you should think of that as being essentially a 10 billion pound a year complex non-for-profit organization. And I think I would say that when I took on the job as chief data officer, its decision-making process was perhaps less accomplished. Uh, it particularly struggled uh, to make balanced investment decisions and to make decisions that uh, made good sense in an environment of complexity and difficulty. And of course, in an environment in the public sector where you have to fight for every penny. So it was dealing with both those manifestations that I was trying to bring value as the chief of data officer mm. and bring data to bear to help in those situations. And as it was a, a new role, what were your sort of your main ambitions going into that role? What were your sort of the, the key things that you were looking to, to achieve? When I was appointed the head of the army, the chief of the general staff, think of him as the chief executive, he told me to enable evidence-based decision-making. Hmm. Now that might sound fairly obvious. Why would a big complex organization not want to bring evidence to bear in its decisions? But there's a long and strong heritage born of that operational experience of instinct and experience-based decision-making. As senior people, we grow from very junior people. We don't buy in from the side. And therefore, those people have developed an ability to recognize ingredients that they need to know to make a good decision. And much of the time that works. But as the army has got more and more complex and has society and the world has changed around it, there's a need to bring much more objective evidence to bear on those decisions. I always thought of it as offering the science to complement the art of decision making. Mm. And did you turn, did you have anybody you could turn to for advice inside or outside the, 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 the army? Well, of course, inside the army, I was the army's first chief data yeah, officer, yes. and I was amongst the very many ranks of people who didn't really know what one was when I started. So uh, very quickly, you realize there's no monopoly on wisdom and you have to seek uh, advice elsewhere. I cast my views out, out with the army, uh, indeed out with defense uh, into the rest of the public sector and also into the private sector. And there I came across a community of interest about chief data officers because this function is relatively new. Mm. There have not been many chief data officers yet and many organizations are in their first iteration of them as I was in the army. Uh, and, and that means that there's a voyage of discovery taking place uh, together by many people who are trying to figure out what good looks like. Mm. Actually, on some occasions, it's just trying to figure out what good enough looks like. Mm. So I sought uh, some advice from a range of people who were very generous with that advice, and I was very grateful for that. Mm. 
What were the biggest initial challenges you had to overcome? Were they more people or they more technical related? There were certainly technical challenges and those technical challenges tended to rotate around assured sources of data and the tools to manipulate those data because we had to develop those from scratch. But by far the biggest challenge was about people. Sometimes that was the people within my own team and it was helping them understand quite what a positive difference could be made by harnessing data. But a similar message was also quite difficult to land sometimes with the senior decision makers. These decision makers were the demanders, users and consumers of the data that we were generating to help them gain better insight. And typically I got one of three responses from them. I got glazy, rolly and sparkly, because that's what their eyes were doing when I was talking to them. I'd have people who were glazing and you could see it in their eyes, I have no idea what you're talking about and I hope you go away soon. You'd have other people who were rolly, here he goes again, banging on about his data, it's not relevant to me, leave me to do my job, I'm good at that. But then you'd have other people who would as halfway through the conversation, they'd be leaning forward with sparkling eyes and they were already imagining the value they could gain from the data. They were already imagining the use cases and the pain points that it could help them solve, even if they didn't really know what a use case was. And I would take those people and help them through their problems and then they would become my evangelists for me. And evangelizing from someone who's benefited is so much more powerful than hearing it directly from me because, hey, I'm paid to say that it's a good thing. And, and you've spoken about um, three ways in which data is being used to help transform the British Army. Um, the first is about the sort of the enterprise uh, pack for the, the board. Uh, perhaps you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Yes, yeah, certainly. And this was absolutely the heart of making sure that the most senior decision makers had the information they required to make good decisions. And that's crucially important, clearly, at any stage of any organisation, but particularly in the Army, where the impact of decisions if, they're taken, if the wrong decisions are taken, can be significant. So the Army Board and the Executive Committee of the Army Board is a long-standing organisation. It goes back to Wellington's time, and so it's steeped in tradition and a certain way of doing business. And the head of the Army, the Chief of the General Staff, charged me to enable evidence-based decision-making. Because members of that board have all grown up from being uh, junior officers in the Army and they've gained experience along the way, and they've got a long and rich set of experiences about making decisions based on their experience, their understanding, and their instinct. My job was to bring data to leaven those judgmental decisions with some objective evidence. Mm. So I worked hard with my team, military, civil servants, uh, and contractors, to put together a pack that helped the board fully understand and readily understand what was important to them and what decisions they should take. Now, it wasn't successful first time or second time, or dare I say it, several times. There was a lots of no, too much, too difficult, too complicated, don't understand it. Mm. And so I swung the pendulum in a completely opposite direction and I rendered it down to its most simple form, boiling it down to the most vital strategic points of the day. What really mattered to the board and how could it make really good decisions? Mm. And the last piece of any process of when you're working data to a place where it can be consumed is called visualization. And visualization is as much art as science. So I brought in a designer specially to make sure this visualization landed in a way that was readily digestible by some very busy people mm. who just could not spend the time working their way through the nth degree of detail in a spreadsheet. It needed to be consumable in a much more ready and intuitive way. And that's what we succeeded to do for the first time. The second area you talk about is, is predictive analysis to help operational mm -hmm. effectiveness. Again, if you could just talk briefly to that, that would be great. Sure. So there are four flavours of analytics. Uh, analytics, the art of looking at information and data and drawing insight from it. Uh, classically, many organisations will talk about uh, stuff where they're essentially, I, li I liken it to driving a car looking through the rear view mirror. Mm. They're looking at historic data, so it's descriptive, what's happening or what has happened, and diagnostic, why has that happened? Mm. Really the value you get out of analytics is when you look at advanced analytics and you look through the windscreen and that's able to tell you what's likely to happen next and what would be the best thing we could do about that. Mm -hmm. And so bringing that together with a couple of very specific use cases about why people left the army and who's likely to leave next and what you can do about that and how we get our people from their peacetime location to the airport or seaport where they will embark to go to war, mm -hmm. which is what the army's job is ultimately to generate forces people, equipment, the training ability and the support of that to go out and fight. Mm. So those are the two use cases that I concentrated on for everyone to understand that there's value to be had in getting after the high end of analytics. Mm. Next, talking about um, creating a data culture and the importance behind that and how you went about delivering that. 
There's no doubt in my experience, and I'm sure this rings true for many people, that cultural change is the hardest change to land. Sometimes you're inviting people to make significant changes from what they've done before and to change their approach uh, to what they've done before. And that's tricky. You're asking for a change in behaviours and a change in approach. Uh, and I think that the trick to that is to have a strong narrative, a really clear message of how what you're trying to do links to the overall vision of the organisation you're supporting. And it has strategic importance to that organisation. It's not trivial. Otherwise, why would you want to disrupt them with change? And that's all about making sure that your narrative is a strong one, that the message is clear and articulated both to your own people and to the people who are going to benefit from the changes that you're uh, seeking. And then you start delivering some of those benefits as soon as you can. And typically to do that, I would started a set of what I call beacon projects, which were small, modest, but important advances in what we were doing, so that they served as illustrators of what the potential was and allowed the people who benefited from it to start understanding what else could potentially be done. That's how you land cultural change. And when you look at all of those three things and all the activities that sit within them, within any large organisation, there's always a challenge around resource. Mm. How did you build the case for greater investment or, or sort of a focused investment behind data compared to some of the other, I'm sure, many challenges that were being put forward? It's a really difficult challenge. When the army, like any other public sector organisation, is paid for by taxpayers' money, there's a really clear and compelling logic that says you don't want to waste a penny. Mm. Interestingly, of course, with data, with an adventure that you're going on where you're trying to say, don't worry, it'll be okay, there's a certain amount of a leap of faith. Mm. The way you accelerate beyond the leap of faith is to deliver what I was calling beacon projects. So some of those analytics products that I was talking about, where you illustrate the art of the possible. You help more people turn from glazy or rolly into mm. sparkly yeah. in their approach and help them understand that this is of use to them. And in doing that, you can accelerate that change and you can argue the case for the balance of investment decisions that flow money towards data. Perhaps harder is even once you've made that first change and you've started landing improvement, is fighting the balance of investment case to maintain the funding. Mm. And, and within your team, and I guess more broadly, how did you encourage people to become self-supporting and generate their own ideas as opposed to setting tasks for people to solve. I guess that's one of the, the biggest challenges of sort of um, potential opportunities for unlocking cultural change. Certainly that is the case and it's a bit of both actually. There's always a list of things to be done, uh, a long, long list on your backlog of things that you want to get after because you know they're going to help, you know they're going to make improvement. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is a simple case of, look, here's a job, here's a task, please go solve that for me or with me uh, or with them. And you work that and get that working. But on other occasions, you get other people saying, well, I was working on a certain problem area the other day, but it occurred to me that we could use that same solution in a different space. Mm. That's clearly a very efficient way of doing business. If you're creating a single solution or a set of solutions that have multiple usages, common to many or common to all around an organization. And typically financial data and human resource data is a great place mm. to start to that because everybody needs a team and everyone is spending or generating money. So those are areas where you go after stuff that has value for, uh, for everyone. Mm. And in that area, do, how did you structure your team and how did that team sort of change and evolve over time? Well, it started pretty small. Yes. It was me and a couple of other people kind yeah. of blinking in the sunlight and wondering what we do. Yeah. But essentially, uh, again, learning from others and yeah. with the help of other people, I gathered around me a small group. It was only 25 strong. Mm. Uh, one of the smallest teams I've, uh, I've led, actually, in my time in the army. It was quite paradoxical that one mm. of the greatest changes I offered for the army was driven with one of the smallest teams. Mm. But it was a growth metric. And so the idea there was that we would think big, start small, mm. and scale quickly. And we scaled up to about 25, and that was a hybrid mix of military, yeah. of civil servants, and of external contractors. And you get a mix there of people who understand military life and soldiering. You get people who understand the business of defence, and you get people who understand the down and dirty detail of what data can do. Bring those together and work them in partnership of what the overall endeavour is doing, and you get quite a powerful combination. Mm. The way you get more bang for your buck is to always make it a partnership mm. with the business area you're supporting. It, mm. Data is not something done to people, it's done mm. with people. Mm. And that's probably a pretty unique combination of civil servants and in, in, uh, commercial people. And how did you gel all that team together, and how, how did you? Uh, get them to work efficiently within within the large organization. So you give them exciting stuff to do for a start. I and mean, these were some relatively junior people. 
I had one uh, guy who was working with me who wasn't quite sure about what I was asking him to do. He yeah. wasn't quite convinced of its yeah. value, and that's fine to have those doubts. And I always uh, am grateful for those doubts because it makes me do that check to see whether I, as a leader, am making the right decisions. But in the end, I was able to say to him, at your level, as an individual, you are going to make the biggest decision, the biggest difference at a strategic level to our board, because you'll be the one providing them with the data and the evidence they need to make great decisions. There is just simply no one else in this organization working at your level who has such a high impact. Mm. That really like, lit his fire mm. and he really got to grips with it and he did an excellent job. Mm. And if, if you're now t uh, looking back on all of the experiences you've had and what's been achieved, what one bit of advice would you give to your successor as he or she takes over the role? My advice to my successor would be You've said for one piece of advice, but I would be twofold. I've already hinted at one of them. Think big. Always keep that big picture. Yeah. Start small with deliverables that you can land, that people understand the benefit of them, and then scale quickly because you'll be raising expectations. Mm. But the second bit of advice is you absolutely have to tackle the data foundations. Mm. Trying to do the advanced level stuff without an assured supply of assured governed data is like trying to build a house on sand. And I'm mm. afraid the wolf's going to come and blow that down. Mm. Mm. And, and now in your uh, new role as Interim Head of Data Transformation at Southern Water, can you tell us about that? It's fairly early days, but just sort of how that transition is going. What's been fascinating is how many similarities there are. The same uh, approach is true. Here's an organization with all sorts of complexity and a certain amount of opacity between different areas of the organization, crying out to make best use of its data, but not quite sure how to. Mm. But its chief data officer, Peter Jackson, who's an excellent operator, has asked me to come and join him mm. uh, to work this problem with Southern Water. And you start again from the same logic. What's important to this company? And they've got 10 very clear strategic priorities. What information and data flows will help you make better decisions, gain better insights to make better decisions on what's strategically important? Now let's line up those products. So what I've done is very much like I did in the army so far. I've started articulating the linkage between those data products mm. and the strategic promises the company makes for mm. itself, for its regulator, mm. for its shareholders, for its customers. And then behind those products, of course, you have to align the assured data, the right kind of tools, and finally, and crucially, the people with the right knowledge, skills, experience, and understanding to work those tools, to deliver those products, to generate that insight for great decisions. Mm. Uh, and um, in terms of new challenges that you'd like to set yourself going forward in this in this new commercial role, have you got a, a, a view in terms of what you'd like to do there? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I've got a lot to learn. And very much deliberately, this interim role with Southern Water is about me serving an apprenticeship. So I'm not just a guy wearing dodgy green pajamas anymore for my clothes. I'm someone who has got understanding out with the army outside defense and outside the public sector. And that's all good and proper because then I can add more value with more varied experiences. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of commercial understanding that I'm acquiring that I wouldn't necessarily have had before. And I think that makes it uh, more possible that I'll be able to add value elsewhere beyond that. Mm. And, and looking holistically at the role, strategic role that data can, can have in terms of unlocking change and driving new growth in organizations, how do you see that evolving? And what do you see some of the sort of the key opportunities and challenges for any organization of any nature, really? Well, it does rather depend on the nature of the organization, its size and its ambitions. But I think essentially the first stages in the journey are the ones I've been describing. You could consider me as a first generation chief data officer. Uh, and that's someone who is helping people get the basics, helping evangelize about the importance of data where it's not readily understood or difficult to imagine, like trying to imagine a new color for some people and bringing that to bear and adding value the next levels of iteration that data will bring, and they're right here and on the horizon, are the things like machine learning and artificial intelligence and some proper advanced analytics and ways that people consume the data as a self-service approach rather than having specialists provide it for them. Mm. Those are the really exciting prospects where the link between data and value add is much closer, much more evident, and much more available to organizations. Mm. That's great, Tim. Thank you very much. That's, that's been illuminating. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.